Um, so Hank Carlo, he's a professor emeritus in the Department of Zoology and Physiology at the University of Wyoming. So he flew in from Laramie. Um, and he's been the director of the University of Wyoming's National Park Service Research Station in Grand Teton National Park. So Hank and I have been discussing all the, the pleasures of uh, managing research stations <laughs> at the same time. Um, he's been the recipient of one of the University of Wyoming's highest honors, the George Duke Humphrey Award for Teaching and Research Excellence. As a physiological e ecologist, he studies how animals adapt to environmental stressors of temperature extremes, food deprivation, and, and habitat loss by animals in areas from the Arctic to the equator. He's published 100 articles or more in the scientific literature, including journals like Nature and Science, which are not easy to publish papers in, let me tell you, um, dealing with spatial and energy needs of small vertebrates such as desert iguanas and muskrats to larger critters like Komodo dragons and of course polar bears, which is on the, on the picture. So Hank, welcome. Great. Good. Oh, wow. That's a good audience. I love research stations. <laughs> I, uh, and thank you, Carol. This, is, this has just been phenomenal to, uh, to be at a station like this. Uh, beautiful laboratory facilities, you know, great staff, uh, two campuses, uh, an outreach uh, program like this uh, to the public. Uh, we have a seminar program that's similar to this uh, in the Grand Teton National Park. And I'll have uh, speakers that, uh, that come in and say, that's a tough audience. I go to national meetings and they don't ask questions like this. So, you know, great audiences. I, I love it. Well, indeed. Um, wow, I, I love your screen. I got a little screen like this, so I might have to put my glasses on. Uh, I am, indeed, a, a comparative environmental physiologist. And I look at... Uh, how animals deal with, uh, with uh, stressful conditions, you know, food deprivation, cold, and people, you know, uh, stresses of uh, just habitat loss. Um, and just, you know, I like to know how animals make a living. So I tried to figure out what kind of a talk to give to you tonight, and so I thought I would make it kind of a multiple chapter talk, but I had to have something to kind of bind it together. So the name and title of my talk is uh, Big Lizards, uh, big bears and little ground squirrels, the importance of comparative physiology, and that's what I am, comparative physiologist, and how we look at wildlife conservation and wildlife management. So I came up with this, this simple but profound characteristic, and that's heterothermia. Heterothermia is just variable body temperature. You know, it goes up, goes down. You know, for you and I, we're, we're endotherms. We're, uh, uh, we're, we create our own internal body temperature, and it doesn't vary all that much. If it does, we go hypothermic, you know, we die. If we go heterothermic or, uh, you know, we get a high uh, body temperature, we have a fever, and we die. So anyway, I'm looking at heterothermia, this variable body temperature and how it influences survival strategies of animals. So you can see this in ectotherms, and ectotherms are the so-called cold-blooded critters, you know, like amphibians and reptiles. And uh, they get their body heat from the outside, you know, from the air and from hot rocks. And they don't generate that much internal body temperature. But these guys can vary that temperature. If it's uh, hot in the afternoon, they get hot. If it's cold in the afternoon, they get cold. But you also see this heterothermia in uh, endotherms, in birds and mammals. Uh, you have poor wells, you know, that go into torpor. You have small mammals like little ground squirrels, and they go into hibernation. So, <coughs> specifically, I wanted to look at heterothermia and how that influences <coughs> skeletal muscle form and function, and then how that indeed influences the energy needs and natural history, spatial requirements of animals, and then how we can use that to make informed conservation decisions, and even what we can learn from these critters, and we can use it in human medicine. So, today, four chapters. It's going to be Komodo dragons, black bears, ground squirrels, polar bears, with this overlying theme of heterothermia. So, uh, I was invited by CRESS, which is the Center for Research of Endangered Species at the San Diego Zoo. And it was to look at thermal regulation, the movement, and the energy needs of Komodo dragons in the wild in Indonesia. And the questions I had was, how much energy is being conserved by being heterothermic? 
and how does temperature influence skeletal muscle form and function and power output, and how does this influence the conservation of Komodo dragons, and indeed, the bottom line is what is the carrying capacity of the Komodo Islands? There are four islands that are in the, in the chain in Komodo National Park, small islands, and limited food. So what is the carrying capacity of those four islands for Komodo dragons, and why is it a reptile and not a mammal, not a lion, tiger, or a bear that's a top predator on those islands? So indeed, Indonesia is a land of just thousands of islands. And we started off in Bali at Denpazar, and we traveled into the Lesser Sunda Islands, and we went over to Flores in the town of Laban Majo. And this is one of the gateways, actually the main one, that goes into Komodo National Park. So we traveled and we put all of our gear on these small boats, and we went into the islands, and we're going to one specific island, and that's the island of Rinchao, where there's about 1,100 dragons. And this is a little port, this La Boya, and uh, it's just a small ranger station that's there. But what we knew about Komodo dragons when we got there was that these guys, they fight a lot, you know? And they're not really territorial, but they're hierarchical. And so these guys just get in these huge combats for dominance. But they have this trait, and it's not a very evolutionarily sound one, and that is that they're cannibals. Big guys eat the smaller guys, eat the smaller guys. So this is not a great trait. So we were wondering, hey, the way these guys thermoregulate, and the way they use their space, and the way they forage, maybe this is keeping those size groups, small, medium, and large guys, kind of away from each other and reduces the amount of cannibalism. So it's kind of easy sometimes to work these guys up. They'd come up, you know, on the porch of our hut. They'd come to the window, you know, and we'd uh, work them up on the floor. But most of the time, you know, we had to uh, go into the back, uh, you know, arroyos and valleys and, uh, and carry our traps. And so we had traps that were made in three sections, and uh, we'd get them back there, and we would assemble them. But I want you to stop and look at what's behind us. This is Opunctia. It's prickly pear. It's a non-endemic invader, and it is really causing some problems. And I'll come back in just a uh, couple of minutes to bring this little picture up again and show you why that's a problem. So what we do, we get some uh, goat meat. You know, we'll put a little uh, eye button, temperature logger. It's a little thing. It's about a stack of three dimes. It's all the big it is, but a temperature logger. And we put a little VHF transmitter on it, put it in the food, and they swallow it. So that way I can get their body temperature, deep core body temperature, as long as it's in their gut, boop, they poop it out in three days. You know, I find it and uh, I download their internal body temperature. So, you know, we uh, measure these guys, you know, you get their uh, morphometric characteristics. Uh, we put a little pit tag in them and we put another little eye button on their head and their body middle of the body and back on the tail on the skin. And I also put this bigger tracking transmitter so I can get them more long distance. And on top of that, I'll put a light logger and I'll put a temperature logger. So that's measuring the ambient conditions. So I'll know how much is in the light shade, light shade, heat cold, heat cold. These guys are moving around in their environment. So this is a uh, graduate student from Uniana University, uh, Denny Sukar, who uh, was helping me out on this project. And whoop, hey man, Denny just found it. You know, this is our eye button logger along with what's left of a goat. So we take that and we download it, and indeed, these guys are heterothermic. This is four days of internal body temperature. They go up in the daytime, they go down in the night, 10 degrees. So if I take that profile and I expand that and I look at head, body, and tail, look at this. At nighttime, at nighttime, that head temperature is hotter, it's warmer than the rest of their body. We say, hey, man, why are they doing that? Well, they have this countercurrent heat exchanger. So what they do is the way this blood flows from their head, they can keep that head warmer longer at night. So why they do that? Well, we've kind of found the hard way. We'd go in there at night, and we'd uh, you know, change the batteries out, and we'd change out the, you know, the gear on these guys when they're asleep. Look at that. This guy's eyes are open. This guy woke up, and we're taking this stuff off. You know, I have my leather man. I'm kind of prying this, and man, all of a sudden, that's a friggin' rodeo. We're just rolling down the hill, you know, along with Russell's vipers being kicked up. It was a mess. And we learned you do not wake a sleeping dragon with a hot brain. So... <laughs> That's what it does. It keeps that brain warm so they can be responsive if they're ever disturbed. Now, it's an interesting thing. In the daytime, they can get too hot. So they try to keep that 
or their head can. So they try to keep that head cool by evaporative cooling. So you can look at this, there's this copious amounts of saliva, they're just drooling down. And they have this gular fold down there in their, in their buccal cavity. And they move that up and down, up and down. It makes turbulent airflow. And so they evaporatively cool, and they cool their head down, we thought. So we had to kind of check it out. We go up on these dragons, we get this little Raytag gun, and we just shoot a little beam right down its mouth and alongside the head. And indeed, what we found out was with 58 flutters a minute, just 58, these guys would keep that te mouth temperature about six degrees cooler. So this way they're keeping their head so it doesn't fry when they're out there in the heat. Okay, now, when you look at this profile, and I said these guys are ectotherms, all right? But they're not a hot rock. You put a hot rock out there in the sun and that's what it does. It goes right up to that ambient condition. You know, right up, let's see if I can get this, right up there, but Komodo dragons don't do that. They thermoregulate what is called an acritic or a preferred body temperature. See, that just vacillates up and down. But it's relatively constant. So they're behaviorally and they're physiologically regulating a temperature which all their enzymes operate optimally. So we want to know, hey, is it, the, is it the amplitude and the duration of this preferred temperature that keeps these size groups, these big, large, medium-sized guys away from each other to minimize cannibalism? Well, we found out, no. They're all the same. Big, medium sized, little guys, they're all about 35 degrees and all last about six hours. And I thought, well, maybe it's a way in which they achieve this that keeps them temporally and spatially separated to reduce cannibalism. So remember I put those loggers on their back. I'm measuring ambient conditions. So here's four days looking at light spikes, looking at temperature spikes. And I count up those spikes for these different size groups, and we found out those small guys, man, they have all kinds of movement. They're going sunshade, sunshade, heat, you know, cold, heat, cold, up on a hot rock, down there in a little hole, up in a tree, and they're foraging for little things, you know, little birds and little lizards. So these guys are sun shuttlers, and that's how they keep that preferred temperature. But when you get over here, those bigger guys, these guys are ambush predators. They're like mountain lions, you know, they're sitting there just waiting on a game trail for something to come by, and boom, they'll nail them. So it's a different way of foraging, it's a different way of thermal regulating, and we think this keeps them spatially, temporally separated to reduce cannibalism. Now, if you didn't see that guy with the tree, hey, you're a prey item. And I'll tell you, it's not pleasant. When you look at those teeth, they're kind of recurved, serrated, you know, almost like, uh, like shark's teeth. And uh, we've seen them take down a water buffalo in late afternoon, and they do some kind of communicating. I'm not sure what it is. It's low frequency or something. But before you know it, you have four of these dragons on, uh, on that buffalo. They consume this whole thing in about six hours. They increase their body mass over 50%. And we found just doing a study that their assimilation efficiency is about 97%. That's really high. But if you look at this, this is the way these guys work. They kind of work as a team with a certain size group. And they just rip things apart. But look at that smaller guy. Now, he has just disregarded those rules of non-engagement for his size class, and he almost becomes a prey item. So, question, now, how much do these guys move? And where do they move? And why is it that they just left that spot right there? See, this guy's just kind of going along the trail up here. So what we do is we track them, and uh, we have a weather station. We can measure ambient conditions. We can measure you know, the temperature of the ground and the air, the wind velocity, the relative humidity, the amount of uh, photosynthetic you know, uh, radiation coming in, and solar power. So all these things, and it comes into what is called the operative, operative environmental temperature. So in terms of distance moved, uh, this is a small guy, moves about oh, 800 meters, 30 major moves during the day. Big guy, 60 kilos, 1,800 meters, and he only has nine major moves. Nine major moves. But remember, he's maintaining that body temperature. Those little sun shuttlers, you know, they're just you know, scurrying all over the place. But this guy only makes nine major moves. How does he do that? How does he keep it constant like that? Well, what they do is they find that perfect operative environmental temperature, and they can just sit there. So the sun is kind of coming down through the trees, you know, the wind is just right, and he can just sit there and wait for a rooster deer or a water buffalo or a pig to come by, and his body temperature, whoops, was right there on that acritic, you know, pretty constant. So we can go in there and we can just see, we can find it. Hey, man, this is looking at the savanna, and I can predict 
dragons are going to be there. Those are the perfect thermoregulatory and ambush sites. However, that's just coming back. Opuntia, the doggone prickly pear has taken over these five islands. Well, there's one. It's called Padar. Yeah, in Padar, I think that there's there's still some dragons there would make them five islands. But it's taken over all these ambush sites and these thermal regulatory sites for these big dragons. And so it's a real concern. And we've really made some heavy recommendations to the park to try to eradicate them. So uh, wild lizard and not a mammal is a top carnivore. I have a table here, and it shows different sized mammals. That's on the left, and on the right are the different sized Komodo dragons. So if we take a big one, you know, we'll take a, uh, a mountain lion, weighs about 60 kilos. That mountain lion moves about 20 kilometers a day. That Komodo dragon moves about 1.7 kilometers a day. 60 kilo guy. So they need one-tenth one of the space. Why not a mammal? Hey, that mammal needs 10 times more space. These are small islands. Well, what about energy? And how do you measure energy on a Komodo dragon? Well, I'll tell you a story later, you know, in terms of the arrogance of academics and why we couldn't do more sophisticated ways, you know, using stable isotopes or, you know, ways to measure metabolic rate without having hands on. We had to do it the old fashioned way. We used a respirometer. We got these guys into a barrel and we sealed it off and we put heart rate uh, data loggers on them. And then we uh, made our lab out in the field, you know, with an oxygen uh, a meter and a flow meter and a pump and a generator and calibration gas. And then we measured their metabolic rate, their oxygen consumption for 24 hours, and their heart rate. That way I can get heart rate to oxygen consumption to kilocalories or kilojoules per day. So here they are, you know, this guy now. Uh, it's not a real attractive packet you know, he's wearing on his back, but that's his heart rate uh, data logger. And so uh, he's free ranging for about five days. Then I recapture him and I download that data and I take heart rate to oxygen consumption to kilojoules per day. So when you do that, this is called FMR, field metabolic rate. It's a metabolic rate of a free ranging animal for a 24 hour period. And this is what small to large mammals look like. This is what small to large Komodo dragons look like. So what is it? It is one tenth of the energy. Hey, Komodo dragons, they're the top carnivore because they need one tenth of space, one tenth of the energy. That means you can get 10 times more dragons than you can a lion, tiger, or a bear. So you can have what is called a panmictic reproductive population where you can have genetic heterogeneity. You couldn't do that if it was a mammal. There's just not enough space. There's not enough energy for them. And so why is it? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Actually, there's a lot. But one is the cells are different in ectotherms. They're low energy metabolizers. The cells have less mitochondria. They have less mitochondrial cristae. They make less ATP. But it goes back to this. They are heterothermic. Their body temperature falls 10 degrees during the night. They have what's called a Q10 of two. That means for every 10 degrees, that metabolic rate, metabolic demands is one half by being hypothermic or heterothermic and dropping that temperature 10 degrees. So they're saving energy. But doggone it, man. Those guys could chase us up a tree in the morning when they were cold just as fast as they could in the afternoon. And you go, oh, come on, man. Is that your, uh, you got to quantify this. You know, we're scientists. You know, this, this, this can't be subjective. So we set up a, a little racetrack. And uh, <coughs> we'd uh, get out there and uh, we'd get a, a piece of goat meat on string and we'd race these dragons. So uh, we had a, uh, we have a, we have a, uh, a high speed video camera and uh, yeah, almost losing there at the end, but he picks up the scent again. So then, and we'd, uh, and we'd, uh, you know, get, the, you know, a radar gun, you know, like they have with the highway patrol. So we would do this in the morning when they were cold and we do this in the afternoon when they were hot. And what we found was, oh, when we get down to the end, this got to be kind of tough because you had all these other dragons who were up on the bluff, you know, and they'd smell that go meat and they start coming down. So when the race is over, you know, there he goes and there I go up that tree. <laughs> okay, so what we found though was that the running velocity was the same when they were cold and they were hot. Well, remember, when they're cold, they have one half the metabolic demands. So how can they be just as fast running when they're cold? 
This guy, you know, he was a 60 kilo guy and he ran about 14 kilometers an hour. That was 14 kilometers an hour right there. So <clears throat> you take a muscle biopsy and you stain it. This is a mammal muscle biopsy. We have, we have mixed fiber type. So all those little structures there are cells or fibers. And we have slow, tish, slow twitch and fast twitch fibers. And those fast twitch anaerobic glycolytic fibers are more temperature independent. So when you take a biopsy from a Komodo dragon and their sprint muscles, they're, fi they're fast twitch anaerobic glycolytic temperature independent fibers. So these guys are heterothermic. They can conserve energy and be cold during the night and in the morning. But because they have these fast twitch fibers, they can sprint. This increases their predatory niche so that they're just not hanging out when that roost deer comes down that, that trail in the morning. Boom, man, they can get out there and just nail them anaerobically. So it's kind of neat. Role of heterothermia then. We're seeing that, yeah, this is really interesting. Uh, there are size differences in thermal regulation and in uh, the way they use their space and how they prey on items. It reduces cannibalism, that they need one-tenth the energy, one-tenth the space. And uh, they have this burst activity that increases their predatory behavior through all the daylight hours. From this, we went back to the park and we gave them the ideas on what the carrying capacity of these islands are, how many roosted deer, water buffalo, and pigs have to be there. And we made these big recommendations and try to get rid of that opuntia so you don't lose these predatory sites for these big sit and wait ambush predators. Okay, that's chapter one. Now, I want to look at heterothermia, and uh, this is really why I was invited here, was to talk about bears. But I just couldn't resist talking about dragons. So, heterothermia in bears. Uh, we're looking now at hibernation and how that influences their skeletal muscle form and function. If you look at a small critter that hibernates, and I don't care if it's a prairie dog, it's a ground squirrel, it's a hedgehog, they all hibernate like this. They will drop their body temperature almost down to freezing. And the Arctic ground squirrel, by the way, can go below freezing. But even the Arctic ground squirrel, every 10 to 15 days, they all, they all come back up. I mean, they don't have to go up topside. You know, they just come up in their burrows. And what they do is they arouse and they pee. They pee. And then they go back down again. So every 15 days, they have to take a leak. So they come all the way back up to pee. So we wanted to know, well, what about bears? You know, what do bears do? So what we did is we uh, surgically implanted uh, heart rate, respiratory rate, and body temperature transmitters in bears, and we monitored them through the winter. And we found that these guys can drop their body temperature only about five degrees below normal, all right, even though they have profound metabolic depression, but their body temperature only goes four or five degrees below normal. And it's relatively constant for five months during the winter. So they do not arouse and they do not urinate. They don't pee for five months. They don't defecate either, but they don't pee for five months. And for five months, they're in a state of chronic hypotension or low blood pressure. Now, for you and I, you know, if we're in chronic hypotension, what we have is ventricular atrophy. We lose the thickness and we lose the strength of our ventricles and we go into a state of ischemia and cardiac failure. So I uh, teamed up with uh, Paul Aezo, as uh, Carol had mentioned, and uh, a buddy of his, uh, Tim Lasky from Medtronics, and uh, we did echocardiography on bears. And we found that during uh, diastaltic and systaltic, which is contraction and relaxation of that heart, that the thickness of that ventricle did not change. It did not change. So these guys are showing no myocardial atrophy. And we think one of the ways that they do this is they go into what's called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. They'll hold their breath and they'll go into a state of apnea. And when they hold their breath, their heart rate goes from da 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 They don't have time, but da You know, three beats per minute. That's really slow. Then <gasps> they take a breath and they go into what's called tachycardia. Then it goes da 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 it flutters. And so what we think is these guys are relaxing that heart and it's saving protein. And then they flutter that heart and it gives them strength. So they go into this respiratory sinus arrhythmia and during the wintertime, they show no problems with muscle atrophy. Now bears, they belong to a real elite group of critters that are long-term fasters. Elephant seals, you heard about this. You know, penguins, you know, March of the Penguin, great movie, all right? Penguins, long-term fasters. Prairie dogs, 
A lot of salamanders can really fast for a long period of time. Well, the biochemistry of fasting is in three phases. Phase one, now, if you didn't go back there and take a snack and you haven't had dinner tonight, you'd be going out of your phase one of a fast. That's all glycogen stores. You, know, you store a lot of glycogen you know, in, your, in your muscle and different uh, organs. And so you're using that as a reserve, but it's gone in a matter of hours. And then you go into a phase two. That's a fat-using, protein-conserving phase. And then you use all your fat reserves, then you go into a phase three fast. Then you really start hammering those structural proteins like skeletal muscle and you're digesting your organs and it results in death. So animals that are long-term adaptive fasters, they have a long phase two. They put on a lot of fat reserves and they have biochemical means of conserving their protein. So we'd uh, go out and we'd get bears in the summertime and we'd put uh, uh, radio uh, tracking uh, collars on them. And then we'd track them to their dens early winter, then five months later, you know, 150 days later, back to their dens again, and we'd test them and compare it. So we'd fly them, get their signal, we'd run our machines, you know, our trucks as far as they'd go, and, we'd, and our snow machines as far as they would go, and then we'd get out there on the horse, in our snowshoes, and we'd track them on horse or snowshoes. And so I've always been asked, you know, where are bears put their dens? Ah, man, north slope, south, you know, they just put them where it's hard to get to period. <laughs> so here we had to go down an ice sheet to get it. This one was down into a, uh, a snag, you know, a, 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 a trash pile, you know, with a lot of timber. So you had to go down this uh, kind of a stovepipe head down, you know, and you're just kind of faced off with this guy. And whatever, and they can get their head and they can get their shoulders, you know, you go in there after them. Uh, we'll use a, a capture pistol to deliver a drug, uh, or we'll just use a jab pole. Jab pole is a lot easier. And it's easier on the bear, and, uh, and, uh, but you have to be up kind of good and close. Sometimes the den is right there. It's only maybe five or six feet back. Sometimes it's far back. This was about 65, 70 feet back. And uh, it was actually a den within a den because she was right underneath this big old boulder, and she had a urine, and it was right over my left shoulder, you know, up a, uh, up a stovepipe. So we anesthetize the bear, and then uh, we uh, bring him out. And the first thing we want to know, hey, how much fat do these guys put on? Well, uh, you look at their blood chemistry. Uh, you know, last time you, you were at your physician, you know, and look at those triglycerides and uh, those cholesterol values, 400 milligrams percent or more. Now, your physician, if that's you, he's saying, hey, hey man, you, Hank, you've got to get out there and do more exercise and go on a diet. But bears are adaptively obese. They have no coronary problems. They have no atherosclerosis. They have no arterial thros uh, thrombosis. So uh, we'll get out there and we'll weigh bears and say, hey, there's my son, Zach, right? And so he'd get out there and uh, help me uh, on, on these projects and get in there and, and, um, and mess around with bears in those dens. So we'd put uh, uh, leads on their, on, their, on their lips and on their, on their back and we uh, determine fat by a bioelectrical impedance. You know, you have this sometimes when you go into a physician and then we measure conductance and resistance across your, your body and you can extrapolate this to fat. So bears put a lot of fat on. This cohort, you know, it's about 35% fat, and they use that fat as the main metabolic substrate during the wintertime. There's a hormone that's produced by the arcuate nucleus, and it's called neuropeptide Y, NPY. And what NPY does is this stimulates the feeding center, the appetite center in the hypothalamus, and it stimulates you to have hunger and go out there and eat. All right, so you start to feed. But you eat you put on fat. Fat produces its own hormone and it's called leptin. And what leptin does, leptin goes back and inhibits or blocks NPY. So leptin inhibits your appetite. So essentially your fat stores can inhibit your appetite. So on bears in the fall, all right, stop eating. In the fall, when they have high fat reserves, they have high leptin levels, and they have a high set point. So they eat, eat, eat. They're hyperphagic. And they really go high. And then that leptin goes, hey, man, you have a certain amount of body fat. It's time to stop. All right? So they go anorexic, and then they go to their den, and then they use that fat throughout the wintertime. And then when it's late winter, that low leptin is there, and there's no longer an inhibition of neuropeptide Y. Their appetite comes back and they leave that den. So high fat reserves, and, uh, and it's all controlled by leptin and NPY. 
So it's not just the amount of fat, but it's the type of fat that uh, the animals put on that's important. We talked about this uh, earlier today. This is um, uh, cow parsnip. Uh, and I'll mention why it's, it's kind of neat. So when you put on fats, fats have fatty acids. And fatty acids are just long chains of carbons, and they have hydrogens attached to them. So this is a saturated fat. So all those hydrogens, and this can be a 16, 20, 18 carbon long fatty acid. But if it's hydrogenated fat, saturated fat, then they are straight like that. If they are unsaturated fats, right there, you have a loss of hydrogens. This is a dehydrogenated, unsaturated, polyunsaturated fatty acid, and it puts a kink in that fat right there. So we not only have fats and fat depots like subcutaneous fat and elemental fat, and, but you have all these fats in your cell membranes, all your cells. It's a bilipid layer. And if those lipids in that membrane are straight, they are saturated fats, they have a high melting point, and this is like butter. You put that butter in the refrigerator, what happens? It's hard. Now, if you have fatty acids in your membranes that are kinked, they are polyunsaturated, dehydrogenated fats, they lower, they have a lower melting point, and it's like margarine. You put that margarine in that refrigerator, and it's soft. So this allows these guys to be heterothermic. They can have a low body temperature, and they can have cells that still function at low temperatures through what is called, uh, well, it's just you know, having more of these polyunsaturated fats. And indeed, these guys have a lot of these omega-3 polyunsaturated fats, and it allows those cells to function at low temperatures. So phase two, these guys have a broad phase two. Why? They put a lot of fat on, and it's the right kind of fat. Now, what about conserving protein? You know, first time I got into a, into a bear den, I was just amazed. I thought these guys are going to be in there, man. They're just going to be saw logs. But by the time you get in, because it might take you six, seven hours to dig them out, they are up there, and they are awake, and they are not happy, and they are fight or flight. I mean, they'll take you on, and they can run out of that den, and they can run five miles through deep snow, and they don't seem to show any muscle disuse atrophy. So remember this. We took that biopsy. I showed you this before. This is a skeletal muscle fiber grouping. This is looking at the slow twitch, fast twitch muscle fibers. So what is atrophy? For you and I, muscle disuse atrophy or sarcopenia is characterized by a loss of fiber or cells, right? These are all cells. Fiber number, size, protein content, a loss of the ratio of these slow oxidative fibers to become more glycolytic. And your slow oxidative fibers are your aerobic endurance fibers. So you lose that aerobic capacity when you go into disuse atrophy and you lose strength. That's atrophy or sarcopenia. So we wanted to know on bears when they fast and they're inactive, is the muscle fiber type, number, cross-sectional area, is it retained? Do they retain their protein? And do they retain their strength? And if so, how do they do this? So we take these muscle biopsies. Now, we do this in the fall and then in the winter. And this is just showing two locations. This is the biceps femoris and the gastric nemius. We, sa we sampled those two. Now we're getting ready to do the other leg. But I want you to note, when you look at that, you go, well, oh, look at that. It's kind of bald. Well, they don't grow their fur back in the wintertime they, because it just costs protein. But they have beautiful wound healing. And for you and I, you know, if we do tissue healing, it is retarded by low temperatures and low protein in our diet. And these guys, in the winter, their temperature is low, and they have no protein at all in their diet. So we did a little study, and we uh, took a, um, made an incision, a circular and a longitudinal one, and we stitched it up, and then we did a biopsy at the end, and we found beautiful healing. These guys have no granulation. They have beautiful resculpturing. They have no, they have, they have uh, uh, type 1 collagen. Uh, there's a contraction of that wound, and this complete scarring. And they think that one of the ways they do this is a vasodilate all that periphery with warm, oxygenated blood. And this is how they can do that wound healing. So now we're getting ready to do that right leg. We uh, take that muscle biopsy, put it in liquid nitrogen, take it back to the, uh, the lab, and we start to analyze it. Look at the morphometrics on these guys. I'm going to show you a series of graphs like this. 
And this is simply going to be looking at this. The gastrocnemius, the biceps femoris, fall to spring. That spring is this hash bar. So this is looking at number, and there is no loss. That hash bar is not lower, so there's no loss in number. And here I'm looking at the size, cross-section uh, area. Gastrocnemius, biceps femoris, fall, or slow twitch, fast twitch, fall to spring. That hash bar is not lower. So these guys are not losing size of the muscle fibers. Then we did western blots and northern blots, and we looked at those slow twitch and fast twitch myosin heavy chain isoforms. And in this technique, you have to look at the density of those blots. And the density of that blot for those slow oxidative fibers did not go down. So these guys are not making that muscle type conversion. So what about protein? Well, same thing. That hash bar is not down. Gastric nemius, biceps, femoris, fall to spring. The protein is not going down. No loss. So, if they're not showing this typical, you know, muscle disuse atrophy in terms of the morph metrics, are they conserving strength? Uh, well, I hate to tell you the things that we thought of to how to measure strength in a bear. And I thought, you know, I'm going to make this little balloon, you know, and it's going to have a strain gauge in it. And I'm going to walk up to this bear. I'm going to jam it in its mouth. And he's going to find out like this. And I can determine the strength of its masseter muscles and how much he bites. Or, you know, I'm going to take a, a bear and I'm going to, again, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tether him to a tree and I'm going to have a, a strain gauge and I'm going to really piss him off and he's going to charge me and I'm going to get the strength and how he pulls against that chain. No, no, no. So I read this paper, my colleague, who became a colleague, Paul Aesio, and he has this, had this brace, and he measured muscle dystrophy and how people would change over time with muscle loss with dystrophy. And so what you do is you stimulate the perennial nerve right there in the knee, and then uh, there's a strain gauge that's right there in the foot treadle, and you measure the strength of the tibialis anterior muscle right there. As you get a maximal contraction, it's non-invasive and it's non-subjective. So went back to the University of Wyoming. We duplicated that, that brace, you know, and we put it on bears. So we put it on bears in early winter and 150 days later in late winter. And what we found was, hey, you know, they lose about 20% strength. That's not much. Because if you look at you and I in a hospital bed for the same length of time, it's about a 70% loss in strength. And when you're in that hospital bed, they're not neglecting you. You are getting water. You are getting food. And those bears, they have no food. They have no water. And they're in a confined space. And they only lose 20% of their strength. So how, you know, are they moving in there? You know, are there any kind of activity? So we got those temperature loggers. And remember, we had one that's surgically implanted in their abdominal cavity. Then I put another one in the den, and then I put another one underneath the fur at the back of the neck. And what I found was this is that deep core body temperature. You know, it's just very, very constant, down about 5 degrees from normal. And this is day, night, day, night, day, night in the den. But this is, these are spikes. All during the day, there's these spikes, you know, on the neck temperature. And so I thought, well, look, let's just take one of those spikes. And this compared to getting, and I didn't really go through a human, uh, 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 what's called an IACUC form to do this, but I put it on the, uh, the back, the neck of my, my students, and I put them on a bicycle and made them ride a bike in the snow, and then we measured uh, the temperature of that logger. And this is that biker, right? And this is that spike on that bear. So what that tells you is these guys are really doing some activity in there, in the, in the den, in the wintertime. So they're maintaining their muscle strength. But if they're doing that, that means that they're generating heat, right? Well, they don't want to do that because they don't want to arouse. So what they do, boom, they vasodilate the periphery and they dump all that heat. Ah, wound healing, right? So all that warm oxygenated blood is vasodilated out to the periphery so they can have this wound healing if they're damaged. And they're maintaining their strength while in that den. Well, we want to figure out what kind of mo motion are they doing. So uh, this is when we uh, went back to Tim and, uh, and, uh, and Paul. And uh, Medtronics, you know, had some extra human pacemakers. And so we got a human pacemaker. This is one of the early prototypes, pretty big guy. But we modified this, so this is a data logger now for muscle EMGs. And we found, you know, when we surgically implanted these in bears, that they have isometric, isotonic contractions and shivering contractions. And in doing this in those dens, 
they're maintaining that muscle mass and heavy chain and isoform. They're maintaining their aerobic capacity, and so they're not losing their muscle mass, and they're not losing their muscle strength, and they're doing some exercise while laying in there. Okay, now I'm going to get back to this one. We've seen this one before. This was looking at nitrogen, and I said, hey, there's no nitrogen loss. We have cell death going on constantly. It's called apoptosis. So our cells are dying and we generate new cells. Well, to grow new cells, you have to have some protein from somewhere. They don't have any protein. Where are they getting their protein to regenerate cells? So they have labile protein reserves. That's one way. You look at some amino acid profiles and hydroxyproline goes up, that means they're, they're digesting their collagen. Serine goes up, they're digesting their kidneys. Hey, alpha amino acids go up, they're digesting their GI tract. Just come on, come on. I mean, they're digesting their GI tract. Yeah, they're digesting their GI tract. 50% of it is gone. 50% of their kidneys are gone, you know. 50% of their liver is gone. And they're doing that because they're using those labile protein reserves to conserve those skeletal muscles. They have to be able to get up and move at the end of winter. They have to forage and find food. They can't take time to go through muscle rehab. They have to get out there and they have to find food. And the muscle turnover, the protein turnover of smooth muscle and organs is very, very fast compared to the skeletal muscle. So they can grow back, they can grow back that GI tract in about a week. Man, that's incredible. So those are labile reserves and, uh, to conserve those skeletal muscles. Now, they also do this. Uh, they do urea recycling because, remember, they don't pee. They don't pee for five months. Now, when you break down protein as a mammal, you generate a nitrogenous waste product. You're peeing every day, and this is one of the main reasons. And the main reason you have so much water in your urine is because this compound, urea, is toxic. So it's synthesized in the liver, and it goes into the circulation, it goes to your kidneys, and it goes to your bladder, all right? And we've always thought of the bladder as just like a body bag. I mean, it's just there so that you can pee when it's a socially appropriate time, right? <laughs> I mean, I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, God, does that make me mad, you know? But that's my boda bag. The thing is, it is not just a boda bag. We're finding that it's more dynamic. And uh, urea, and it's a very simple compound. It's a carbon with two nitrogens on it. Urea, in certain animals, can go across that bladder, and it goes into the GI tract. And there are microbes in there. They're called urealytic microbes, and they have the enzyme urease. And it breaks that urea down into ammonia and CO2. That ammonia goes to the liver, and it's resynthesized into new amino acids, and that goes back to skeletal muscle. All right? And that CO2, that's exhaled out. It's just exhaled CO2. So this is where the little ground squirrels come in. We had to use them as surrogates because it was kind of tough working on bears in the lab. So what we did is we put an N15 label. We tagged that N15 right there, and we catheterized that into the bladder, and what we found was there it is. It's in the skeletal muscle. Wow, man. The only way that N15 can get up there is from that urine in the bladder, that urea in the bladder. So what they're doing is they are breaking down that skeletal muscle, but they are resynthesizing it back, and they're maintaining the protein in that muscle. We found that there's urea transporters. It's a uh, 47 kilodalton protein, and it's found in the bladder, and it's found in the GI tract. And it is upregulated when these guys hibernate, and the really microbes, the bacteria that's in there, uh, also is elevated. So we wanted to know who's good at this and who's not so good. So we got a bunch of critters, and we put them in a chamber, and we put C14 urea in the bladder, and then we measured C14 CO2 exhaled, okay? And so we went down to Costa Rica, and we got a bunch of vampiros, vampire bats, you know, in some caves down there. We brought them back to the University of Wyoming. So we looked at vampire bats, we looked at badgers, and we looked at marmots, we looked at ground squirrels, we looked at prairie dogs, and this is what it looks like. There's a vampire bat. Well, vampire bats are sanguinivorous. They just drink blood. What's blood made of? Water and hemoglobin, protein. Water and protein. So evolutionarily, they just have not evolved the microbial urease, urolytic microbes, and they haven't evolved those UTB 
transporters. So there's only 0.002% of their urea is hydrolyzed. A colleague and friend, Perry Barbosa, has found that bears, black bears, recycle 100% of their urea. Where do we stand? Hey, right there. About as good as a black-tailed prey dog. I have to clarify this. Not all of us. Pregnant females can recycle about 21% about as good as a Wyoming ground squirrel. So what does that tell us? That tells us that humans can recycle urea. We have the transporters, we have the gut microbes, and we can upregulate them. But wouldn't it be neat if we could go one notch over and be 100%? You could conserve your water, you could conserve your protein, you could conserve your, your, your muscle strength. If you had renal failure, you don't even have to go on dialysis machine, you wouldn't have to go on dialysis as often. So be a bear. It's kind of neat. <laughs> so, heterothermia then. Uh, we can see that it's associated with adaptive uh, obesity. Uh, they have adaptive wound healing. Uh, they have no cardiac atrophy. They have minimal skeletal muscle atrophy. You know, no loss of muscle fiber type, cross-sectional area. They keep their protein. They recycle urea, and they retain their strength. Now, if we look at bears, you know, what is the advantage of this? Well, you know, that den is not perfectly protected. You know, very often they're, they're open and you get uh, wolves and you get cougars that can come in. So it's a fight or flight response. You maintain that strength, they can defend themselves. And like I said before, they have to be mobile when they come out in the spring. They don't have time. They have to go through muscle rehab. They have to find food. They have to grow back their GI tract and their liver. And so this is an advantage to them to, uh, to be able to do this. And for human medicine, oh man, what a great research model. You know, human obesity, heart disease, kidney disease, sports injuries, hospital confinement, cryosurgery, space travel. You know, I'm going to show my age here, but my favorite movie was Alien 1. I was in love with Sigourney Weaver. And when she got out of that little space cabinet, she was buff. She was ready to take on that alien. She was muscle. She was fit, right? And she'd been in that thing in this, this kind of suspended state. And she wasn't covered in her own pee, right? So she was not in there as a human. She was in there as a bear. She's maintaining muscle strength, muscle tone, and recycling her own urine. All right. I'm going to finish up just a little bit on polar bears. Um, and we'll look at heterothermia in polar bears and how that's associated with muscle strength and muscle form and function. And what is called walking hibernation. Now, for polar bears, it's only the pregnant females that hibernate in the wintertime. Uh, but a lot of researchers, well, some researchers, have been making this claim that polar bears can go into walking hibernation in the summer. You know, and it's a very contentious thing because, you know, you get a lot of uh, climate deniers, global climate deniers, that say, hey, man, these polar bears are specialized. They are special animals. They can really go for long periods of time without food. You know, they're pretty hardy. They're going to make it. So we wanted to say, do bears show this summer walking hibernation? Are they something special? So this is uh, work I've done with colleagues, Marav Bandavid and uh, John Whiteman. And we've been looking at one population of polar bears. There are 19 populations that are circumpolar. And we're looking at one that's in the southern Buford Sea uh, along the, uh, uh, the uh, north slope of Alaska right next to the Chukchi Sea. So uh, climate change. Uh, what we see here, this is, ooh, can I get rid of this? Has that been up there very long? I wonder how I get rid of that. Uh, oh, can I do that? Uh oh, uh oh. Well, let's see if it, uh, if it goes away in a minute. What we have with Arctic ice is you have two things. You have shore ice and you have what is called hard, hard multi-year ice. And it's always doing this seasonally. So in the wintertime, you have the hard ice and you have the shore ice is milled and it's a single ice cap. But in the summer, that shore ice melts and the hard ice melts out towards the North Pole. This goes on year after year. But if you can see up there, underneath that is showing you where the ice edge was in September, the end of the summer in uh, 1980. And now 
this is where it is in September of uh, 2008. And Right now, in 2017, that ice edge is right there, right there. So we're losing that ice. We're losing, we're getting about 10 more ice-free days every decade. And it's been going on for about 50 years. Yeah, so let's see if we can show that. See, that's where it was. And that's where it's gone. And that's where it is right now, right there, okay? So we're losing that hard ice. Why is that critical to polar bears? Well, they're dietary specialists. They eat seals, ice seals, bearded seals, ring seals, and uh, seals live on the ice. And the bears, the only way they can get them is being a predator on the ice. You don't have ice, you don't have seals, you don't have bears. It's as simple as that. So these guys are marine mammals. I mean, they swim for a living. Now, if you look at this, it's really kind of neat because they just dog paddle. They dog paddle up here, and their hind limbs just, just trail out behind them like this. They don't kick. They just trails out like that. It's just like kind of a rudder. But traditionally, those bears, you know, they look out there at the horizon, and they go, oh, man, the ice is out there. I know. That's a 60-mile swim. All right. All right. Oh, I know. The ice is out there. It's a 100-mile swim. Well, we had a bear that swam 650 kilometers. That's over 400 miles. Straight swim, 11 days. And it lost a yearling in doing that, and it lost a lot of its fat and a lot, a lot of its labile protein reserves. And so uh, uh, this is happening more and more now. It's becoming very commonplace. Now, because they're marine mammals and they swim, they really can't run very well. If you look at them, their hind limbs kind of flap back and forth like this, you know, and they have a tremendous amount of insulation, both subcutaneous fat as well as that fur. Boy, you just put your hands in that fur and it is so warm. But they overheat when they run, so they are not good predators on big game. They cannot take down caribou. They cannot take down muskox. Brown bear can. These guys can't, all right? So on this population in the southern Buford Sea, we have two groups, and this group has to make a decision. This is along the north slope of Alaska, right here. Here's Barrow, and this is down in the Anwar. And uh, one group, when the ice starts to melt, stays on land, okay? So they just kind of hang out there for the whole summer. No food there, right? Because they're not good predators on big game. Now, the other group rides the hard ice out, you know, towards the North Pole. Now, they're having a real problem because it's going out now beyond the continental shelf. You're out there in those pelagic waters. There's no fish, no fish, no seals. So those guys don't have any food out there. So we wanted to compare these two groups in the southern Buford Sea and to see their stage two fast. Do they have a prolonged stage two? You know, do they have big fat reserves and protein, labile protein? Can they conserve it? And do they go into this walking hibernation? Are they special critters? So we'd go out there, and ice was first off. We'd do our, our uh, flight runs. We'd come in there and, and anesthetize bears. And they would do a whole workup on them. You know, we'd uh, weigh them. We would, uh, we'd age them. Uh, we would take uh, morphometric measures, measurements on them. Uh, this is a big bear. This is about 1,400 pounds. And you can just look at that paw, man. You know, compared to my hand, this is, a, this is a big, big bear, this is a big male. And then we take breast samples and we do uh, isotopic signatures, look at stable isotopes. From that, we can determine what they eat and when they ate it. And we'll put a surgical uh, transmitter in their abdominal cavity. And we take muscle biopsies and we take fecal samples and uh, blood samples and urine samples. And then if we come back at the end of the summer, all right, this is the time they've been fasting now, at the end of the summer, and we'll do another flight for those bears that have stayed on the land. And so uh, uh, we'll weigh them and we'll measure them. And this is looking out towards the, uh, towards the Brooks Range out there in the horizon. And then, uh, you know, uh, uh, take our muscle biopsies. And uh, then we have to look at those bears that are out there in that hard ice. So how do you get to those guys? Well, uh, we got onto uh, the last of, actually, I think we broke this ship. I hate to say this. This was the Polar Sea. Uh, this was a, uh, a Coast Guard uh, icebreaker, and uh, they sent a, um, a Mike boat in or a landing craft to pick us up out of barrel, and we, we went out there, and we were pretty hard on this ship. Um, my colleague, Marav, told that captain how to drive his ship. 
could not believe it uh, because she just didn't think we were going hard enough to get our bears. And so we, we, uh, we, were, we made it do some pretty amazing things. So we spent three months out there and uh, going through uh, this ice. And, you know, the ice gets very thick. Uh, anywhere two, three, four, you know, 15 feet thick, especially where you hit these friction ridges. So you're always looking for those at night. You hit that friction ridge and it just stops your boat. Got to back it up, hit it again. So once we get within uh, 50 miles of uh, our last GPS sighting, then we get out there in the helicopter and we'll fly uh, big, you know, concentric circles until we, you know, cut uh, the tracks on a bear, then fly in and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, do all of our measurements on bears at the end of the, uh, of the season. So um, then the big question is, are these guys specially adapted? And the answer to that, unfortunately, is no. They are not. They do not go into a walking hibernation. They do not recycle their urea. They don't do all those things that I showed you that a, uh, a black bear does in the wintertime. They don't do that in the summer. So they're not specially adapted. They have their, their, their prolonged phase two. They're a good adaptive faster, but they can only live as long as they have fat, and they can only live as long as those protein reserves. Once they've used those, they're gone. So if there's no ice and there's no food, there are no bears. So we looked at those bears that were out there on the ice, and those guys were really getting hammered because there was absolutely nothing out there for them. And the bears that are on land, well, you know, they can eat bird eggs, and they can eat kelp and seaweed, and they get some berries, and they get in the trash. You know, Hudson Bay bears, they're just trash bears. And then they'll get on this, whale carcasses. Now, on the North Slope, this is what's saving them right now because the Inupia uh, whalers have a certain quota of whales, bowhead whales, that they can harvest. And they leave all those carcasses, and all the bears go into the carcasses. So they feed on that. But, you know, 10 years ago, we had uh, only about 10% of this population was on land, and now we have 30% of that population is on land, and that food resource is almost depleted. So if all those bears are on land, they just can't, can't succeed because there's just limited food resources for them. So it's a pretty bad scenario. We have 20,000 bears now by 2050. This is going to be our first, first time this could be an ice-free summer. Not going any ice, polar ice, in the summertime, 2050. And uh, those bears are going to be down to about 4,000 bears. So you can't do this. You know, you can relocate them. <laughs> Where are you going to relocate them to? There's no place to take them. No ice, no bears. So my little theme was heterothermia. So we saw that, you know, we can use this on Komodo dragons. And we can see how we can actually make conservation decisions. We know what the carrying capacity is on those five uh, small islands with limited space and, and energy. We can learn a lot, and bears, uh, you know, can go into heterothermia in the, in the wintertime and maintain their muscle mass. And looking at polar bears, that gives us a good insight that you're only as good as your physiology allows. And they've got right to their maximal extent, and they're pushing the limits. And, uh, and so... Uh, we know what those limits are. So it's just a slide, you know, that's uh, acknowledging my funding sources and uh, my wonderful colleagues that I've enjoyed working with uh, on all these projects. So thank you. Right. Yeah. Turn the lights on. We have time for some questions. Yes. Um, if a black bear doesn't fatten up for the winter um, enough, does that mean his hibernation, hibernation is short? Sure does. Yeah. Uh, they'll actually um, they'll leave that den in the wintertime uh, when that, that fat reserve is down, that leptin is down, their appetite is up. So that means they're going to get out there and they're going to start to forage. And if there's nothing to forage on, and you know the thing is, What's out there? Grass, you know? And that's where they start. They start eating grass, and then they look for carrion because there are no berries, you know? So their GI tract and their flora has to really, you know, uh, be inoculated, you know, to, uh, to be able to take advantage of any kind of food that's out there. But if they go in there lean, then uh, this probably means bad news for them. You know, they're not going to survive that, that winter, or they're just going to barely survive. You know, if they have cubs, then that really takes a lot of fat. Uh, because they're, they're interesting, because they're delayed implanters. 
You know, they'll breed in June and they don't them plant until about February. And in utero gestation is only about 30 days. I mean, it's only 30 days. But they have this really long, long, long lactation. And lactation takes fat. So if they don't have the fat, then they're going to lose those cubs because their milk is not going to have enough fat in it. So it's uh, pretty tough on them. Quite a bit, quite a bit. Uh, we were funded, you know, by NSF as well as by, by NASA. You know, and they're really interested in this in, this in terms of long distance space travel. Um, there's, a, um, there's quite a bit of research right now that's going on uh, on what is called hibernation induction trigger. It's uh, kind of like an opiate, like Dattel. And what it does, it can cause metabolic depression. And this colleague of, of mine that we have chatted about, Paul Iazo, works on human hearts. So if there's a patient who has donated his body or her body, it goes zip right into his lab. And so here's a human heart. It's the most bizarre thing ever. It's just beating away. And he'll put uh, bear blood in there, and he'll put daddle and these delta opiates, you know, to see if it can actually cause, you know, reduce the amount of ischemia and, uh, and prolong tissue life. Uh, so right now, if you're going to do a, an organ transplant, let's just say you're going to do a kidney, you know, you have to get it in the recipient within uh, 24 hours. But you put bear blood around that kidney, it's got 74 hours. So, I mean, that's just one area, you know, that we're, we're looking at, at, at bears and, uh, we, and we put it into, uh, in, into human medicine. And there are a lot of people who are just looking at hibernators. We do a lot of work on hibernating ground squirrels and prairie dogs and how their kidneys work because their kidneys just shut down. I mean, they shut down. Uh, it's called acute renal failure. And for you and I, acute and chronic renal failure, it's, it's death. But uh, these guys, they shut their kidneys down and they come right back up again. So we're trying to figure out using hibernators as a model in terms of um, how kidneys function. Kidneys are really, really complex structures. Uh, and, uh, and hibernators, they, uh, they can do some pretty wonderful things with theirs. Yes. Well, I think most species, period, uh, can do that. Uh, and uh, what can happen, I mean, it can be bears, it can be ungulates. If they don't have a sufficient amount of fat stores, then the, uh, the embryos can be reabsorbed. Uh, and uh, the fetus, at a certain point, can even be reabsorbed. Or it can be aborted. So there's not a, all, a lot of altruism in utero. Uh, if there's no fat, then that fetus is aborted uh, pretty early on, and then, then the mom lives another day you know, to have a, a healthier litter when it has more fat. But that's very typical of most animals. In, uh, well, yes, uh, let's just use polar bears, for example. There's a lot of work that's going on right now on uh, looking at those 19 populations. Some of them, by the way, are, are not doing too bad. Uh, but nine of the 19, 10, 11 of the 19, you know, are, are showing signs of sea ice loss and a loss of koi's, which is cubs of the year. So they're losing cubs of the year and some of the juveniles are showing uh, low condition. And so they're not going to make it to adulthood to be the, the breeding population. So that's going to be you know, one of the ways you're going to see this is the demographics is being altered right now. But uh, there's always, you know, somebody can always say, well, look at this population over Greenland. They're doing extremely well. Yes, they are. All right, there's no, there's no getting around that. But other populations are not. And they're all going to follow suit because it's just based upon food. No food, it's not going to make it. Yeah, you know, uh, there's more and more work on seals going on now, but it's just, 
amazed all of us that we haven't focused on the pinnipeds earlier, two decades ago, to know really what's going on. You know, we've been doing a lot of work on killer whales and looking at cetaceans, but we haven't been looking at the seals. Uh, but the data does suggest that, um, that they're going to be getting hit pretty hard uh, because uh, they're, when they're, their breeding sites are on the ice. This is the bearded seals and, uh, and the ring seals. And uh, they need the ice domes, and they just can't really breed and have successful pups on land. So they need that ice, they need it for protection, thermal protection, and access to food as they dive. So they can't go into this, uh, you know, like on a, on a surf area. Uh, but, you know, in evolution, the first thing that really evolves is behavior. And so it's just behavioral plasticity. So we're seeing there is a certain amount of behavioral plasticity in terms of breeding, you know, both of seals and bears. But I'm, we don't know where, where that's going. But it needs a lot more research because that's the food base. You know, and, and people often ask, too, you know, we talk about hybridization of, of uh, polar bears with brown bears. And that does occur. You know, it's not just in the zoo. It occurs in the wild. And the F1 generations are viable. <coughs> but, you know, what do you have? You have... You don't have a polar bear anymore. You know, you have a hybrid. Uh, and, uh, and they're not really, you know, it's 50,000 years, you know, of a special adaptation to do what they do. And uh, so um, we'll just see just how they do make that. Uh -huh. Is the sea ice disappearing because of human caused activity or is it because of natural cycles? If it's the former, would you recommend concrete? Well, you know, uh, yes, I would, uh, I would recommend getting on a colleague's my, uh, yeah, website, uh, Steve Amstrick, uh, and he's with Polar Bear International. If you get on that, uh, he, uh, all the statistics are there, and to answer your question, what you can do, there's a list of things, but let's just go over a few things. Yes, we do have naturally occurring climatic changes, and it takes time. We're not talking about thousands, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years, tens of thousands. But, you know, anthropogenic causes, we're talking about rapid changes, which are really faster than evolution, especially for big animals with short generation times. So this is having a profound effect on these animals. And uh, so sea ice, because of uh, uh, greenhouse gases, uh, is, is being lost quite rapidly. Um, the biggest thing is, what you can do, you get involved in, in, in with, with your politicians to uh, bring out you know, the 99% of uh, climatologists and, and climate scientists uh, on what they agree with, and that is that we have an anthropogenic cause here. Uh, what we can do is just be uh, more minimalist and, uh, uh, and less consumers. Uh, next time I Go to a McDonald's, I'll demand. I don't want, you know, five pounds of, of paper and, and plastic with my meal. So it's just to be more conscious in terms of uh, how we live our own lives and, uh, and, and what we're contributing to uh, CO2 and greenhouse gases. But um, Polar Air International, it's, uh, it's, it's a really highly recommended site. Polar Bear International? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, they haven't done. They 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 have these guys uh, with radio uh, tags, you know, with GPS collars, but there are not that many of them. I mean, it, we know that it does occur but it doesn't occur all that, that often. And so we don't really have a population to follow. We have some individuals to follow. And uh, they just have been recognized you know, in the last five years. So, uh, but we do know that it, it can occur. All right, well, I'm sure, I think Kay. I'd like to entertain any more questions you have, but please join me in thanking Hank for coming. Hey. Well. Thank you.